So I'm Elijah. I'm currently at Citrix. I run the machine learning platform. And yeah, and I'm Stefan Krafczyk. And so it's formerly of the team, but uh, we're the, uh, the two creators of Hamilton, which we're going to talk about today. I uh, expect most of this talk to come from Elijah. I'm going to pop in with any salient points, and otherwise I'll be monitoring uh, chat channels uh, and Discord. Um, yeah. Just trying to answer questions. And if I stumble, he will jump in and help me. Cool. I'm going to get started then. Um, awesome. Really excited to be here with you. Today I'm going to talk about something I'm really just interested in and have had a lot of fun with. And this is an open source framework that we built. It's called Hamilton. I'm going to talk about how it can help you build scalable feature engineering, and we'll dig into all of what that means. So first, uh, take homes in case you fall asleep for the rest of this. Uh, I want to convince you, A, that feature engineering code is difficult. And so maintaining it, uh, handling it over time, scaling it, that's all just a complex thing. Hopefully, that's something you're familiar with. Feature engineering code, because it's difficult to get into a loop where the maintenance work on it is actually harder than the building of it. Uh, so that you get to a point where you're continually maintaining and spinning, and that building new features is difficult. Hamilton was built to help you escape that loop, and it's easy to get started with and easy to use. So before I jump into anything else, I want to stress that we're not selling into anything to you. Hamilton is open source code. Uh, install at PyPy, Conda, get started in less than 15 minutes. We have a bunch of great documentation and a lot of good examples. I'm putting some work into this. All right, so on the agenda today. First, I want to tell you a story of uh, the project that motivated Hamilton, which was a data science team that was going through a lot of pain at Stitch Fix. Then I'll tell you a little bit about the solution, how it works and why we created it, or how we created it. Next, I'm gonna talk about how it can help you scale feature engineering. Uh, and by scaling, I actually mean two things. We'll dig into what this means. Uh, one is scaling sort of with the complexity of the business. So scaling as the human and team component gets more complex and interesting. And the other is scaling the compute and data that you handle. So handling bigger data and running on more machines. And finally, I'll talk about the open source progress and the next steps with Hamilton, like where we're going. So let's dig in. All right, uh, first I want to set the scene and talk a little about the company I still work at. Um, it's called Stitch Fix. And if you're not familiar, uh, it's a pretty simple idea. So you create your style profile, uh, meaning you fill out a form online and you give us information about what you like and what you don't like, sort of what might fit, what might not, what you'd like in the past. Then you get five handpicked items curated by both an algorithm and a stylist to work together to get you exactly what you want. And then there's a feedback loop. So you keep what you like and send back the rest. Another avenue uh, that we introduced recently is uh, you can shop at your own personal online curated store. So algorithms can help recommend the clothing for you and you check out what you like and return what you don't. Uh, so the interesting thing here is that data science powers pretty much everything in the user experience. There's a lot of feedback loops where we can learn, a lot of recommendation algorithms, and we've kind of put data science into every piece to optimize the customer experience and optimize the business. All right, so data science powers the user experience. And as such, we have 100 plus data scientists and data platform engineers building out this, building out this offering, building out this, uh, building out the tricks. So you can see, you can follow the blog. Um, it's called multi-threaded, it's a cute little pun. Uh, there's also an algorithms tour that sort of shows you how algorithms are woven into the fabric of Stitch Fix, like our fabric puns. So I want to talk about Stitch Fix's oldest model, which was the model that was responsible for forecasting the business. Uh, this is forecasting demand, signups, and churn. So building off of the talk that was just given. Um, and the structure looks something like this, right? Pretty standard machine learning life cycle. So you got your data coming in from the business. You mess that around and turn it into a featureized data frame, uh, fit some time series models, use those models to predict the future, and that generates a data frame with a forecast that your data product you give to somebody else. Let's, we're going to dig into the featureized data frame part because that, that's what was really giving them challenges. All right. Well, the slides are animating weirdly, so I'm going to have to look here. Um, so what this looked like is a thousand plus operations on a simple data frame, a lot of configuration buried in, and multiple layers of configuration and sort of scripts to help you visualize the data. And there's a world-class team running this. So I, 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 the animations got me way to the lead here. But the point was, what got them here wasn't going to get them to the next place. So they were building this like highly complicated set of operations. And it was just getting too complicated for them and too much to manage. Uh, the infrastructure itself was getting to the point where they were thinking more about that, more about the script shape, and less about the actual work and uh, analysis they were doing. 
so uh the so like so the problems what, what was going wrong with this uh unit testing ended up being very difficult and was almost never done the whole thing was sort of put together in one big monolithic script and not separated nice as you could unit test Documentation was unnatural and unenforced. Uh, there were just a lot of code comments. You kind of have to grep through the code base and dig in. Really, you're looking at the code to figure out how it worked. No comments for you. Uh, modularity was effectively non-existent. It was all sort of buried together. To treat it as a data catalog, you just have to do a lot of grepping. Again, if you want to figure out how a piece of data, how a column was generated, you'd have to look through and figure out exactly that from the code. To debug it, you had to run the whole pipeline. Uh, no running an individual piece. And to do data validation, you had to run the whole pipeline as well. And this was not really done. Just sort of after doing some initial research, they trust it was good and not have a sense that it was continuing to work over time. So this was a good initial solution because it helped them really quickly get up to speed and they had a great mathematical model that was powering. But along with time, uh, this turned into spaghetti code. So what happens when you have all of these problems and you want to expand your models to new regions? You want to forecast what the UK looks like. You have to add complex scenarios on management, management's whim. They want to start seeing, what if we up marketing spend here, sort of change the onboarding workflow? You have a data bug, and you have very little time to solve it. And the answer was, this really wasn't fun. I want to stress that this isn't a unique experience to Stitch Fix, time series forecasting, or even Pandas. This is where we got our start, but we're sort of thinking more general purpose than this. And I'm imagining that all of you can kind of empathize with this, uh, with this sort of feeling of, of things getting more complicated and the infrastructure not quite supporting it. So I don't know about you, but this is something that I've hit many times in my life. I don't always write complex data pipelines, but when I do, it turns into an unintelligible mess of spaghetti code, the more and more I need to add to it. So let's talk about the solution we came up with at Stitch Fix, uh, which, we're calling, which we called Hamilton. All right, so the moment, the, the aha moment that we got was the idea that what if instead of just writing a bunch of columns as sort of procedural lines in a file, each one corresponded to exactly one Python function? And furthermore, what if you could determine the dependencies from the way that function was coded? So that's how we came up with Hamilton. Uh, in Hamilton, the artifact, sort of column in this case, but it can be anything, it can be more than just pandas, data frames, and series, is determined by the name of the function. And its dependencies are determined by the parameters. So pretty simple. We'll go into what this means in a second. Uh, but here's what it looks like in practice. So instead of writing these sort of procedural data frame transformations that you might be really familiar with, you declare your uh, transformations as functions and write them out. And again, Hamilton supports all Python objects, not just data frames and series. So instead of the original way, you got your outputs corresponding to the function name. You got DFC defines to def C there, and DFD uh, corresponds to def D there. And then the inputs are the function arguments. Hopefully pretty simple. Uh, and here's what the whole uh, hello world looks like. So you don't just write the functions. There's one more piece. You write the driver. Um, the functions are all sort of contained within modules. So it's nice modular. And the driver says what and when to execute. So you can see we uh, import the driver, import those functions, run the driver. Uh, or instantiate the driver, pass it any configuration to get it started and the functions you need it to run, and then run the result. And in this case, we're going to add a data frame. But again, it can work with anything, not just the series and data frames. All right. So the TLDR here. For each transform, you write a function. Functions declare a directed acyclic graph, a DAG. And if you're not familiar with what a DAG is, it's just a way of sort of computing this flow you can see on the right there. And Hamilton handles the execution of, these, of this DAG. So we've got our functions, we've got our driver, functions naturally form a DAG, driver uh, runs these functions, and we're good to go. All right, so there's more. You might be wondering, okay, if I have to write a, call, a function for each column, each artifact that I have, that's gonna be a lot of functions. And what if all these columns are like kind of repeated? Um, so might my code end up being more verbose? I want to say two things. So yes, it might, but it's not always a bad thing. That said, you want to keep your code dry. You want to not repeat yourself as much as possible. So when it is a bad thing, we have a lot of decorators to give you higher order capabilities on top of functions. So we have abilities to attach metadata, to parameterize, to, so this is sort of like curries and repeats a function, kind of like a for loop, if you will, uh, to extract columns. So if you have a function that outputs a data frame, you can turn that into multiple series. 
Uh, we also have one that I'm really excited about, which is data validation. So if you want to assert that your data looks a certain way at runtime, uh, you can use this check output decorator. It's extremely powerful and plugs into a lot of frameworks. I'm not going to go into it in this talk, but if you have any questions, reach out later. I'm happy to talk about it. I have lots of good documentation. Uh, we've also got uh, configuration ones to make sort of the configuration and shape of your pipeline simpler. You can think about this as an if statement in your code with over functions. And we're adding new ones all the time. This isn't the full set, and we have a lot more, so I'm super excited about that. All right, so to summarize and drive this point home, uh, Hamilton forces you to write transforms and Python functions. And these Python functions help you decouple the implementation of your logic from its execution. So they provide you everything you need. Unit testing is simple. You got plain old Python functions. You can test them as you normally would. Documentation, you just use the doc string uh, Citrix. We have this automatically generated documentation process. It's really exciting. Modularity, everything's in small pieces by definition. And functions are organized into modules. Uh, it naturally forms a data catalog. So the code is the central feature definition store. So if you want to figure out where your feature is defined, just search it in the code. It'll be real easy. And debugging is straightforward. You can execute functions individually, add breakpoints, and if you have, know there's a problem in the data, you can easily sort of like traverse the DAG to figure out what's going on and where it might have started. And the data can be, you can sleep well that your data is going to be trustworthy. There's a lot of validation included out of the box. So decorators provide powerful higher order operations, and the driver can decouple the transform definition from the execution, making it so you write your transforms separately to how you run them and thus only think about writing them or running them, not both at the same time. All right, a stitch fix has been really successful. We've been running it in produ production for two and a half plus years. I think it's now three now. And the initial use case manages 4,000 plus feature definitions. Uh, data science teams love it. So it enabled a process of monthly model and feature update for the time series forecasting to go four times faster. So they get a lot of time back and they can focus more on building their models as opposed to running their systems. It's easy to onboard new team members. Code reviews are nice and simple. It's sort of the code is very logical and you can easily see how a function change. They finally have unit tests for the first time and they have automatically generated Sphinx documentation so they can understand what their pipeline does. And a little fun evidence here, um, some eye candy. On the left, I want to show, this is an older one, it's been, I'm sure the order of the commits has changed since then. But on the left is the commits. You can see I do like a bunch of little commits. So I helped build it out at first. Uh, but since then, Jason has written like almost 200,000 lines of code. So this is a very big, very complicated thing. Uh, and data scientists have taken it over, which is really exciting. They love it. They work on it. It's very natural to them. And the airplane on the right is their crazy visualization of how the directed acyclic graph works. Um, this is the most satisfying visualization of a complex DAG I've seen. Uh, they've colored it according to modules and tags, and it ends up looking really pretty. Um, not much you can pick up from that, so though, so it's a little eye candy. All right, uh, so we talked about uh, why we created Hamilton. We talked about what Hamilton is, and I want to talk about how Hamilton can help teams scale, right, or help uh, help you scale your feature engineering pipelines. So let's talk a little bit about feature engineering and what this looks like. And so looking at the whole machine learning sort of model lifecycle, uh, we've got a few components here. Uh, so the first part, featureization, which we're going to dig into, you load the data, you transform it into features. Then you might use that data to fit models and use those models to infer, sort of run it on other data, predict, predict the future. You can model the entire machine learning workflow in Hamilton. We've seen both open source cases and cases at Citrix where they do that, but I want to focus now on featureization. So this works for any Python object type, not just pandas, um, but we're going to focus on pandas because it's nice and simple right now. And it's embeddable anywhere Python runs. Uh, you can run an orchestration system, Airflow, Kubeflow, Metaflow, FlightKit, Prefect, Dagster. We've even seen people run it in Flask apps where they want to like cleanly represent their data flow from request to response. And that's modeled in a Hamilton DAG. Cool. So uh, how do you model featureization in Hamilton? Well, a few pieces of code that need to be written. Two function files in the driver. So there's your functions to load the data. These sort of bring it in from your data warehouse, from SQL, from the internet, wherever you get your data. You then write functions to transform uh, your data. So take it from that raw form into something that your model will be useful, and then a driver to materialize it. Cool. And then you can execute only the pieces that are needed. 
Right, so you're like, oh, I just want to write the tables that go, or the columns that go into this table, run it, we can run all the dependencies, and Hamilton's smart about that. All right, so why is this hard? Well, as I kind of got to earlier, the difficulty here is in scaling. And what do I mean by scaling? Well, there are two ways that we think about scaling, and I think this is kind of a novel approach. Um, I'm sort of excited about sharing. Uh, and Hamilton was built to solve one and can help you solve the other. So there's the notion of human and team challenges. So this is scaling up as the complexity of your problem and it changes and as the team changes and morphs around you. So this is dealing with highly coupled code, code that's coupled to infrastructure and slows down your velocity. Dealing with debugging, uh, difficult, difficulty debugging and understanding workflows. Um, handling messy collaboration on complex pipelines as two people are editing at the same time and trying to figure it out and validating your data. So Hamilton was actually built to solve this problem and was really built to help you scale sort of into the complexity of your data flow. But it also can help you solve the compute challenges. So if your data is too big to fit in memory and you can't easily parallelize computation, Hamilton allows you to integrate into a bunch of powerful frameworks that already exist to do this. Again, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. There's Spark, Ray, Dask. We're going to talk about how all of those work in just a minute with Hamilton. But we want to be able to use Hamilton to give you the power of all these distributed frameworks. And as Hamilton is a nice sort of logical layer, it makes sense to then delegate to these underlying frameworks, thus giving you the ability to scale both in complexity and in data size. All right, so how do we scale in the human and team components sort of, sort of scaling with the complexity of your workflow? It's cool, so Hamilton can help you decouple code uh, either from infrastructure where the driver handles execution and the, hand, the function handles business logic. A lot of the function modules handle business logic, allowing you to run the driver separately from writing the function. And Hamilton can help you decouple code from itself. So code is organized into functions, functions are organized into modules, and the functions that you don't know about Hamilton, you can reuse them anywhere. If you're using Hamilton, you have a bunch of functions and you decide you don't like it, take those functions elsewhere, it'll be easy to string them together. So you can see, uh, one really cool thing is you can even have multiple drivers running your functions in totally different ways. You've got your staging, you've got your prod, you've got with different databases. Pretty easy to work with and pretty flexible. All right, Hamilton can also make it easy to debug. So to knock bugs, all you have to do is rerun the broken path. So if you see that DAG there, if, spend, if the spend zero mean unit variance is weird, you can start sort of like running up and seeing what data is weird and thus not have to deal with rerunning the whole script and getting lost in it. Uh, Python functions allow for unit test and natural debugging, or unit testing and natural debugging. It's really, it's much easier to work when you know your logic is sort of contained within a few lines. It gives, we give runtime data quality checks, so it can be easy to debug and figure out what was wrong quickly. And then we can quickly narrow the search space uh, for these data bugs that I've been saying. Hamilton can also help you understand and visualize your pipeline. So you can visualize the data flow in the execution path and clearly track dependencies. Again, it's all a DAG, and the DAG is easy to see. You can see from visualization, but you can also just sort of trace it up through the functions by following their parameter names. Hamilton makes it easy to collaborate within a team. So as it provides a central feature definition store, uh, it forces alignment on naming. The, as everything is referred to by its name once, it's easy to think about and sort of make that very natural. Document is in, documentation is included in natural. It's again, part of the Python doc strings and minimize conflicts when collaborating. Everything's organized nicely into modules. So you can both be working on a pipeline at the same time. Uh, change and it makes change management easier. The feature versions are always included in Git. So all changes are part of Git history and the PRs are easy to read. You can trace these back to functions. So if you wanna figure out when something broke, you can look back, do a bisect, figure out exactly where that broke and then see which function changed. All right, so to sum up the scalability with some code, uh, the whole goal here is we want our things we write in Hamilton to be very simple and easy to read. So hopefully this code is pretty straightforward and it's clear. And what it's supposed to say is that the feature client height normalized defined above is owned by the client recommendations team. You can see it's tagged, it contains no personal identifying information. The GDPR concerns also tagged, is of type float, there's our data check, depends on two upstream features, height zero mean and height standard deviation, has no null fe NAN features and produces values in the negative five to five range, right? Version control system shows, it change, shows its changes over time and you can grep the code base for downstream dependencies. So there's a lot packed here,
But the goal is we want to make it so you don't have to look at like YAML files, functions, scripts, et cetera. It's all just buried inside one simple function that's easy enough to read and self-contained. All right, so we talked about how Hamilton can make your work as a team a little simpler and help you scale. How does it help you scale the compute and data aspect? All right, so the approach here is to delegate. And we have three frameworks we're gonna talk about today. We're always sort of adding more. Uh, one set is Ray and Dask. Dask, so they can help you run in parallel and scale from a single machine to running in multiprocessing to running in a cluster. And, and this is great if you have sort of a lot of different computations that you want to offload. And then we also support pandas on Spark, as used to be called koalas. And this allows you to scale horizontally per data set. So if you have data that's bigger than infinite memory, you can use pandas on Spark uh, to help that happen. It's probably something you're familiar with. And the thing that I want to drive home, as I'm going to be showing you a decent amount of code in the next little bit, is that switching almost always only requires changing driver side code. And this is a function of decoupling the functions from the driver. Right. So the idea, you write your functions, then you can switch to use these different frameworks and only change your driver side code. A slight caveat, pandas on Spark requires changing of one small set of functions as well. I'll show you what that means in just a minute. Cool. So scaling with Ray, uh, what does this look like? Let's take a look at a pretty simple driver. We uh, do our import our data loaders, our date features, and our spend features. We've got a configuration that sets up the driver. The driver then runs with all these models. Uh, so date and spend are just sort of features that you could use in a time series forecasting model. Uh, choose the features you want, just run those, and then materialize your data, right? So extract, transform, load, pretty simple. What does this look like with Ray? All right, so running on Ray just requires a few simple additions to the driver. We import our Hamilton Ray extension and Sanchez something called a graph adapter, which basically tells us how to walk and execute the graph. We pass that into the driver, uh, run everything just as we normally would, get it our future data frames, materialize it in the end, shut it down, give your resources back to your friends, be a good citizen. So nice and simple, only a few additions, no change to the code for Ray. And now we've got something that runs fully in parallel, potentially across a cluster. All right, so what does this look like with Dask? It's the exact same, actually. Uh, we we import our Hamilton extension for Dask, create a graph adapter. Uh, we actually pass it a result builder so we can sort of put them all together in a pandas data frame, take them back. Uh, then we instantiate a driver and pass it the Dask graph adapter, run it just as we normally would, shut it down, give resources back to your friends, and we have run everything in parallel using Dask. All right. That's nice and simple. What does this look like on Pandas on Spark? So slightly more complicated. There's uh, one, one extra piece here, but mostly it looks the same. So import your Hamilton Spark extension, create the Spark session, set your options, whatever you want to do, uh, run your Spark Koala's graph adapter. In this case, we're passing it a spine because Spark, the notion of index is as natural to Spark as it is to Pandas. And pass that in. The only other difference is we're going to be passing in a new set of data loaders that loaded into a Spark data frame so the rest of the pipeline can work. Finally, run our features as we would, save our data frame, stop it, give your, uh, give your compute back to your friends, and close down the Spark session. So fairly simple. Um, and what does this all look like? How did this work? So we've got our functions and our driver, right? Our driver loads up our functions, turns everything into a directed acyclic graph. Then we delegate to Ray and Dask, right? So the one simple trick of distributed systems for us here is all we have to do is call out to the APIs within our graph adapter. As we walk to Dask, the DAG, create a remote uh, or Dask delayed, similar things, uh, allowing us to run and delegate over to the Ray and Dask ecosystems. And with Spark, uh, one more trick, all you have to do is change these to load Spark pandas equivalent objects instead. Spark will take care of the rest. Uh, so it's nice and simple. Cool. All right, so are there are a few caveats here. We're kind of working them through. Serialization, you have to use the serialization methodology of the underlying delegated frameworks. Memory, should the default should work fine. Uh, fine tuning at a function level isn't quite supported yet. For Python dependencies, you need to manage them. We don't have a framework yet to manage that. Uh, and we're looking to graduate these APIs from experimental status. So this is where we want contributions to help extend support in Hamilton. Yeah. Uh, one more, I guess, Elijah. So on the, um, so on this, it's uh, 
one of the things you just have to think about also is your data set size. So some of these, uh, I guess, frameworks, you know, do, do require some sort of data or things operating at scale. So in which case, if yeah. you have small data and you want to, you know, quickly parallelize things, you might run into kind of serialization costs. But, you know, we're still interested in people playing out with, with no matter the data size in terms of uh, using these features. So if you have feedback, if, if something's not working for you, do let us know since, you know, we, we have a few, di few ideas, but would love to kind of prioritize given feedback. Awesome. Thanks, Vaughn. Cool. All right. So how's the open source stuff we're looking and where are we going next? All right, uh, open source progress, early stages, but thriving community. We have multiple high profile users, IBM, UK government digital services, British cycling team, Federal Reserve, Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, Citrix obviously, and a bunch more that we didn't list here. It's 700 plus stars on GitHub and a growing set of core contributors. But we're looking for more. We want more contributors, uh, more bug hunters, more user feedback. Any way that you engage, we love because we just sort of get to learn about the open source community and give back. And that's really exciting. And what's our vision? Where do we want to go? Well, I think we're looking at being a unifying layer for machine learning ETLs. So Hamilton specifies a logical way to, uh, to represent your data flows. That's nice, clean, and easy to read. Uh, but it doesn't do everything in the vertical here, right? It doesn't orchestrate for you. It doesn't sort of do external storage and all that stuff. Um, so our goal is to be able to compile to an orchestration framework, right? So Dagster, Prefect, Airflow, Metaflow, these are all great options. I've used them all before. And Hamilton could allow you to write an interface that would then plug into these and run on these underlying systems. Uh, we want to be able to integrate with more data quality vendors and open source options. We have a few, and it's pretty straightforward, but we want to be able to add integrating with it, say, Arise or Y logs. These are both great uh, things that I've worked with before. I want to make it so it's trivial to load from a variety of upstream sources. So all you have to do is build a little adapter and load from Snowflake load from DuckDB, load from whatever data warehouse you've got. And then we're thinking about adding more natural SQL support. One of the things I'm really excited about DuckDB is it sort of bridges the gap between SQL and Python, allowing you to sort of seamlessly jump between the two. And I think some transformations and especially data loading are fairly natural to represent in SQL. So I want to make that more of a first class citizen. All right, so getting there, we're making a lot of progress. Uh, we have a bunch of new decorators coming on all the time. We just released a decorator that allows you to reuse a big portion of your uh, sub DAG, and I'm working, you're starting to work on more natural SQL support, as I said earlier. And again, we're listening to uh, requests. Users are uh, asking for stuff all the time and we're building them. So happy to build stuff that you might need. And then we're looking at more informative execution. So how can we compile down and sort of specify this data flow uh, in a way that it can keep our sort of decoupleization, decoupling from functions and materialization and can we build sort of more fun user interfaces that allow you to interact with us? And again, if you have any ideas, we're all ears. Cool. So give Hamilton a try. We'd love your feedback. Um, please give it a star on GitHub. Create an we're vain. We love, we love our stars. Uh, create and vote on issues on GitHub. We love sort of working with the community. And join us on Slack. Here's a link. I can send this to slides out later. Um, but it's also on our documentation. So thank you. Um, Really appreciate your time. If you have any questions, you can yell at me online on Twitter, connect with me on LinkedIn, code with me on GitHub, and here's my email. Use it sparingly. Thanks, folks. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Thank everyone. you, too, definitely, for co coming out to the, this conference. All right. We got, like, one last minute. Yeah, happy to answer any questions.